I'm David Lasso. The program is Collector Talk. And I'm reading one of the more interesting journals that I get as a collector. As I've said all along, it's very important that we tune into the different avenues of keeping in touch with the collector market. This particular one is called The Numismatist. It's published by the American Numismatic Association. The column I'm reading is called Numismatic Vignettes. It's published by who I'm pleased to say is a friend of mine, Glenn B. Smedley. Now, Glenn recently had a collection that was sold off a few years back. Um, where he offered a tremendous amount of exquisite uh, paper items, die proofs, specimen notes, Illinois obsolete type notes, probably one of the finest collections to be offered in many years. In any case, Glenn has been involved in numismatics for almost 50 years. He's one of the venerable gentlemen of the business. Well, Glenn's getting on in years now, and we took a trip down to Colorado Springs to visit him. But some of the things you should know about him, he has put together one of the finest collection of Victor David Brenner medals that the country's ever seen. He had a major work that was written up on it, once again in the numismatist. And these medals were of all different shapes, sizes, um, by one of the most famous medallic sculptors in this country. And in case any of you don't know who Victor David Brenner was, he's the man who designed the penny. So next time you look in your pocket and you see that picture of Lincoln, that piece was done by Victor David Brenner. In any case, Glenn Smedley has sat on the ANA Board of Governors for a total of 18 years. Two of them as vice president, and he holds one of the lower life memberships in the American Numismatic Association. So we're going to take a short break, but when we return, we will be in Colorado Springs where we will be talking with that venerable old gentleman, Glenn Smedley. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Diabetes, a disease which depletes the body's energy, is a leading cause of blindness, heart disease, and a stroke, and can lead to early death. Yet Bill Carlson, a diabetic, can enter endurance events like the Ironman Triathlon because he controls his disease with a blood test, which gives him immediate feedback on his sugar levels. Bill will swim two and a half miles, bike over a hundred, and run a marathon in a single day. With his doctor, he plans to test periodically along the route. I need my strips. Well, I'm going to be using the, uh, the test strips so that I can, you know, just take my blood and test it even while I'm on the bike. And I can, you know, that's a two-minute procedure and it won't take long at all. I'll probably be tested like every hour. He adjusts insulin and food intake to maintain stamina and avoid insulin shock, finishing the race in 13 hours. Bill Carlson, 2.39. Not all diabetics want to be Iron Men, but they can control their disease and lead active lives. Consult your physician and go for it. real difficult to look in the opposite direction when somebody's talking. Yeah. <laughs> You're right about yeah, that. It really is. You're right about that. <laughs> We're going to make it easy on everybody. Look out of the corner of your eye. <laughs> Hold a mirror up. Yeah. <laughs> Say, you guys are never going to get away from here at the time you was thinking of. Well, we're going to roll tape real quick. So All right, suit yourself. We're just about ready. <laughs> okay. Uh, while we're on the subject of metals, I want to show you something. I think if I have one proudest possession of all, this may be it. Hold it by the edge, but it isn't like a proof. It's not anything you have to worry about. Look at the face of it and then read what's on the back. That looks like the she-wolf. That's right. It's circled Romulus. That's the right. The sculptor to Glenn Smedley, you had a... She gave it to me. You know who she is now, don't you? She wasn't then. You don't? Chief engraver and sculptor of the United States, States Mint. Oh, wow. 
Yeah, she did the half dollar. Yeah. The recent one. Where it yeah, went. she gave me one of those too. That is amazing. It's a beautiful piece of stuff. Now I had that engraved on the back of it. She didn't. But I wanted it labeled, so if anybody ever stole it or anything, <laughs> it'd be damn well. <coughs> it's the only piece I've ever seen. It's never been for sale. Oh, she's EJ. Got her initials on it. And what is Urba? Urba Roma. I don't know Latin well Urba. enough to. It was done as a commission on a commission to the premier of Rome that he could use as a gift in his state affairs. Is he taking... Okay. Glenn, I understand that you were publisher of numismatic vignette for the, Numis for the American Numismatic Association for many years. Uh, that is correct. I don't have the exact period of time, but something like that. And uh, that column ran and talked about a little bit of everything, more of banknotes and... The understanding that I had when I started that, and I, incidentally this was a, an outgrowth of a suggestion from Elston Bradfield. The understanding was that I would write this column about anything I wanted to, presumably mostly connected to, is that what he's doing? Presumably mostly connected to numismatics, although not definitely. And the thing, the, the criteria and the whole thing was, I'll write something when I've got something that I think is worth writing. When I don't have, I won't write anything. I do not yeah. promise to have a certain number of column inches for every issue or every other issue. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why if you go back over the years, you'll find sometimes I have a whole lot. Uh, other times I may skip several issues. Uh, so... Uh, that was the basis of the numismatic vignettes. And by and large, I've collect, connected them with numismatics, although sometimes a little remotely. Mm -hmm. In terms of the Professional Numismatist Guild, how do you feel that they function in the hobby today? Well, I, am, I have nothing against dealers as such. Now, there are few dealers that I consider somewhat unethical, and of course I don't condone that, but that's not because they're dealers, it's because of the way they operate, unethical. Uh, I don't think that uh, dealers ought to try to d dominate the ANA. I think the ANA should be independent of the uh, dealers. Sure, we need them as advertisers. I'd be a damn poor collector if I didn't have any dealers I could go to. Uh, I have bought most of my medals. A lot of my other things, I've bought them in auction sales from dealers and some off of the floor. Kind of a necessary evil. Yeah. I understand you had a very substantial collection of Victor David Brenner medals at the Boston Convention several years ago, not this last year. Oh, that was Baltimore. Anyway, uh, I ran across a medal that I knew was a Victor D. Brenner, yet it wasn't signed, and that is a bad thing on Brenner medal. You have to go to great length to prove that they are because he signed most of his work. That's one of the great things about it. And uh, I wanted to buy this. I called a fellow who I considered to be an expert, and he said, Glenn, that's not a Brenner. And I was so damn sure of it that I bought it, paid several hundred dollars for it, on the condition, and I've still gotten the, still got the little written thing that it's returnable for full refund within six months. But I convinced myself that it was definitely, and I now have two of them, and except for the ANS having one, they're the only ones I know of. 
because it was not a regular issue. He did not issue it. It was done. It was done for an organization, but it was never adopted as a regular issue medal. So it's sort of what you'd call a trial piece or something like that, I guess you'd call it. You Have you seen a $100,000 bill lately? Few people have. At the American Numismatic Association's Modern Money Museum, visitors can view fantastic displays ranging from an antique coin press to rare coins, metals, and paper money valued at thousands of dollars. Coins can depict the battle for liberty, or the birth of a nation, the passage of a dream, or a hope for the future. Each coin has its own unique story to tell. More than just a means of exchange, coins are miniature works of art that chronicle events in history. The American Numismatic Association is the world's largest organization devoted exclusively to promoting the study and collection of coins and paper money. The museum, located at 818 North Cascade in Colorado Springs, is open Tuesday through Saturday from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Admission is free. This is Lou Rawls, and I'd like to tell you about a remarkable woman, Mary McLeod Bethune. Most of her life was dedicated to education, and she founded Bethune-Cookman College, and she served as president. But she was much more influential as a leader in federal government and as president of the National Council of Negro Women, where she worked diligently for non-discrimination, women's rights, student aid for education, and in her later years, the formation of the United Nations. In 1955, certain that her death was imminent, she wrote her legacy, which contains these words. I leave you love, I leave you hope. I leave you a thirst for education. I leave you respect for the use of power. I leave you faith, I leave you racial dignity. I leave you finally a responsibility to our young people. Mary McLeod Bethune, part of America's black heritage and today honored by the Postal Service. This is David Lasseau. We've been in Colorado Springs, the home of Glenn Smedley, who is the public relations man for the American Numismatic Association. You, have, you say there's a problem with the word numismatist for the collectors today. Well, I think the novice collectors, and especially the general public who don't uh, have any particular knowledge of collecting, uh, miss, get the wrong impression from the word numismatics. They think it's a highbrow thing, that uh, you've got to have long hair and a uh, million dollars and so forth and so on. You've probably known all the greats in the business. Tell me a little bit about some of the people that were actually your friends. I have known some very uh, Fluent collectors, and they are just about as hard to sell something to as as some of the poor ones. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know whether this rings any bell with you or not, but it will with a lot of people. Avon Carter. I knew Avon fairly well. One of the greatest collectors, and he formed one of the greatest collections. Of course, he start he built on his father's collection. His father had a good collection, and he built on it. He was one of the greats. And it didn't make any difference to him what the price was. If he wanted it, here's the checkbook. How much is it? But he didn't just buy it because you told him he ought to buy it or uh, because he thought it was a bargain or something like that. I often, if I may quote this little humorous thing from him and I was at a convention once in the southwest and it was a small convention and devoted entirely to foreign numismatics not US 
And I was uh, there representing the ANA, and I was at the entrance. And here comes Eamon Carter walking in, and he said, hello. And I said, hello. I'm surprised to see you here. I didn't expect to see you at a convention like this. Oh, hell, he says, I didn't come to the convention. I came, this is our poker night. <laughs> he was there to play poker. He didn't hear about it. So, well, I'm sure you've known a lot of famous men in the business. You said Abe Kossoff was one of your better friends? Abe Kossoff was a good friend. I liked Abe, and Abe liked me, I think. In fact, I feel sure he did. You wrote about you in his book. Yeah, that's an autographed copy, a complimentary copy. And you say you didn't meet B. Max Mel? Yeah, I met him several times, but we weren't, I wouldn't call us friends. I'd say we were acquaintances, and we did meet several times, uh, just sort of at a club meeting or something casually. I bought a few things for him, but not much, but mostly because he didn't deal in the type of material I was interested in. What would you say to a collector who was starting out today? Well, I would encourage any collector today not just to talk to a collector and because he's interested in a certain phase, decide that's what I'm going to collect. I think that the collector, that the novice who wants to be a collector, should look at the different phases of collecting. The ANA has a marvelous library, the largest lending library in the world on numismatics. Numismatics, and uh, uh, they can get books general on general numismatics that will give them a viewpoint of different types of collecting, mm -hmm. and uh, study that and find something that interests you. Don't try to force yourself to collect something that doesn't particularly interest you. You told me you had a friend in the or an associate that said collect what the other guy doesn't collect. That's right. Always collect what the other fellow doesn't. What would you say to the Board of Governors of the American Numismatic Association? Well, I think I've been saying a few negative things here. So the opposite to my negative things are the things I'd say to them. Uh, the board should take a more individually and collectively take a greater interest in the ANA. Uh, don't just stand by and let George do it. Uh, there is nobody on the board named George right now, by the way. So we we just want that's right. We just want to be sure that that's uh, yes, sir. That's right. There is. I'm really glad to have had the opportunity to talk to you, Glenn. Ever since I was a young man and a collector, I followed your column, and I remember you. Well, I've enjoyed what a lot of people have said. Uh, in Abe Kossoff's thing there where he wrote about me, of course he mentioned numismatic vignettes, and he said, now this is Abe Kossoff, not just uh, some nobody. Abe says, I always read Glenn's vignettes. I get a chuckle out of some of them. And I thought that was about as high a compliment as you could get from a guy like him. Can I still stick in a word here? Uh, I want it to be understood that I'm not an employee of ANA. I retired last <coughs> spring, and I'm not an employee. Uh, they gave me a title just so I could have a connection of uh, whatever it says on there, emeritus. Uh, and uh, so I am not in any way, and I'm not located at the uh, headquarters. I'm unable to leave my home, and I do whatever I do from here. I got a typewriter over there that I can hunt and peck out a few words now and then. Well, Glenn, you are not an employee of the NA. You are an institution and a okay. foundation. All right, thank you very, very much. I appreciate this opportunity. I hope people will take it in the manner that I've tried to give it. Okay. Well, okay, thank you. I've enjoyed the opportunity to talk to you. This is David Lasso. We've been in Colorado Springs, the home of Glenn Smedley, who is the public relations man for the American Numismatic Association. Thank you.
This is Lou Rawls, and I'd like to tell you about a remarkable woman, Mary McLeod Bethune. Most of her life was dedicated to education, and she founded Bethune Cookman College, and she served as president. But she was much more influential as a leader in federal government and as president of the National Council of Negro Women, where she worked diligently for non-discrimination, women's rights, student aid for education, and in her later years, the formation of the United Nations. In 1955, certain that her death was imminent, she wrote her legacy, which contains these words. I leave you love, I leave you hope. I leave you a thirst for education. I leave you respect for the use of power. I leave you faith, I leave you racial dignity. I leave you finally a responsibility to our young people. Mary McLeod Bethune, part of America's black heritage and today honored by the Postal Service. Have you seen a $100,000 bill lately? Few people have. At the American Numismatic Association's Modern Money Museum, visitors can view fantastic displays ranging from an antique coin press to rare coins, metals, and paper money valued at thousands of dollars. Coins can depict the battle for liberty, or the birth of a nation, the passage of a dream, or a hope for the future. Each coin has its own unique story to tell. More than just a means of exchange, coins are miniature works of art that chronicle events in history. The American Numismatic Association is the world's largest organization devoted exclusively to promoting the study and collection of coins and paper money. The museum, located at 818 North Cascade in Colorado Springs, is open Tuesday through Saturday from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Admission is free. We're back. I'm David Lasso, the program's Collector Talk. We've just returned from Colorado Springs, where we spoke with the venerable gentleman of numismatics, Glenn Smedley. But now we're here for the mailbag, so we're going to flash a number on your screen so that if you have a collection that would, you'd like to be on Collector Talk, or you have a question about collectibles that we can try to answer for you on the air, we'll show you that number right now. That is P.O. Box 4592 in beautiful Boulder, Colorado, zip 80306. Now, we're back for our first letter. Here's one. Dear David, do you know the value of an original Shirley Temple pouring glass from the 1939 World's Fair? I have one of these items. Where can I locate collectors of such an item? Well, great. You've got a great collectible. Number one, Shirley Temple is very popular. I even remember when I was a kid. Of course, they go off into greater things and become politicians and so forth. But also, people collect World's Fair items, so you've got a double whammy on one particular collectible. Plus, it's a glass, pouring glass. People collect those, too. So you've got uh, three different levels of collectible item in one thing. Something like that, there are conventions, once again, that travel around the country that specialize just in glass. What you need to do, get out that phone book, call up those antique dealers, find somebody who specializes in it, get at least three different opinions. Don't tell the, first one what the, don't tell the second one what the first one said. You want to get a nice neutral opinion on it. Uh, something like that, I'm sure, would be, bring a pretty penny to the right collector. So you've got something good. Um, here's another one. Dear David, I've just seen your show on television and was fascinated with the pictures of collectibles. Please send me more information on collectibles. My address is below. Thank you. It looks like a young man named Joel. Joel, at this point in time, we don't have any blanket type of information we can give you. We just advise you to tune in to Collector Talk, and you'll learn about collectibles that way, as well as go to your library, read, 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 read. Get those books and find out about things that way. Perhaps at some point we may start a newsletter, but for now um, we'll just try to answer things on the air. We'll go to one more letter. This one is, uh, Dear Mr. Lasso, I've observed your interviews on television, and I have two baseballs with the following signatures. Ball number one. If you get too many, we'll have to walk you. Um, but anyway, Al Schacht, Kirk Altork, and Lefty Grove. Ball two. Frank Lefty O'Doul, 
Babe Ruth, hey, I know that one. Um, Lou Gehrig twice. Joe DiMaggio, Willie Mays, and Carl Hubble. Wow. I'm interested in determining the value of each ball and advice on the best way of marketing them. I've enclosed a self-addressed envelope. Appreciate those envelopes. It's tough to answer everybody. Um, you've got some great balls here. Um, don't don't want don't want to have anybody go on strike on that one. But uh, um, definitely the Babe Ruth and the Joe DiMaggio and the Lou Gehrig are, are big money names. Anything with Babe Ruth on it is worth a couple of hundred dollars just to start out. Um, so heading up from there. Uh, the sports collectibles are one of the most popular areas now in collectibles, and you should have no trouble in finding a local dealer that specializes in them. Again, I re-emphasize to get several opinions on them. The ways to sell would be to get outright cash offers for them from the dealers, and probably your best bet might be to put them in an auction because then you get bids from several other people. So um, you all have been writing in very regularly. We really appreciate it. We don't always have a lot of time to answer the letters, but we'll do our best. We're going to show that number again. So if you have a question about collectibles or you'd like to have your collection on a, one of our collector talk shows, that's P.O. Box 4592 in Boulder, Colorado, way up in the mountains, 80306 for zip code. Well, that's it. We're done. We're going to take a break and see you next week when we have another exciting show of Collector Talk. Hopefully we'll travel, no telling what we'll see. We go all over the country now to find collections. So until we see you next week, I'm David Lasso. The program has been Collector Talk. Thank you.